Welcome to Argonne National Laboratory. Today, in today's program, we're going to be talking about medical isotopes. What are medical isotopes, you ask? Well, medical isotopes are radioactive elements that doctors use in the diagnosis and treatment of various illnesses, including cancer. To unpack what medical isotopes are and what role argon plays in their production, we've invited the program manager and deputy program manager of Argonne's radioisotope research and production program to the program today. Without further ado, let's, in, let's welcome the deputy program manager, Dave Roche, to the program. Good morning, Dave. How are we doing? Good. How are you? All right. So my first question, a couple softballs for you. What is an isotope and how are they made? All right. So isotopes are just parts of uh, naturally occurring elements. Uh, a radioisotope is a unstable version of that isotope. So there's different, several different isotopes that are available um, that we can actually either produce or occur naturally. Uh, here at Argonne, we are taking natural isotopes and then converting them into radioactive isotopes and then purifying them and making them available for the uh, medical community. And what are the various uses for these isotopes? Well, in the uh, medical arena, uh, we can use these to diagnose and treat uh, illnesses. Uh, right now, we're really interested in the cancer aspect of this. So what we can do, if we come over here, uh, we can make these isotopes and put them into some sort of a pharmaceutical drug where we take our radioisotope, we coordinate it to our happy little fiddler crab here, which represents a chelate, connect this to some sort of a linker, and then a biovector represented here by like a protein. This construct can be injected into the body and seek out different cancers. So for example, here we have a patient who is suffering from metastatic prostate cancer. We have a diagnostic isotope that's been attached to that uh, radiopharmaceutical drug that's been injected and you see all these red dots, or the black dots, I'm sorry. Those are cancer sites. And after a, some treatments with a therapeutic radioisotope, you can see that the cancer is in full remission. That's the type of exciting things that we can do with these isotopes. That is exciting. And actually, you took my next question out of my mouth when I was wondering how doctors use these isotopes. So I'll jump to the next one, which is, in the case of cancer, how do isotopes help doctors treat cancer? But aren't radioactive elements damaging to tissue? Okay. So everything in moderation, right? So radiation uh, has been linked to some cancer. But if we use it uh, accordingly and properly, we can actually treat cancer. So in the case of a diagnostic isotope, that's injected in a very small quantity, and the emissions that are coming off of these radioisotopes go directly out of the body, and then you have a camera that is surrounding you. Think of like an MRI or a, a CAT scan. Same idea, but instead of those instruments interacting with your body, something inside of your body is escaping, and then we're detecting these in a 360 array around you. So we can pinpoint exactly where these cancers are. In the case of therapeutic, what we end up doing is we uh, look at the um, linear, linear energy transfer of these uh, emissions that come off. And, and the range inside of tissue is very small. So if we can isolate these radioisotopes near or on the cancer site, then we provide a cytotoxic dose specifically to that cancer, largely uh, sparing uh, healthy tissue. Further radiation plays a lot uh, more impact on fast-growing tissues than it does on slow-growing tissues. And cancer is, of course, a fast-growing tissue. Slow-growing tissue is typically more healthy cells. That's perfect. So um, we talked a little bit about how isotopes are made, but my specific question for you at this point is, how, do, how does argon make isotopes? So we have a couple different ways of making isotopes here at argon. We have our low-energy accelerated facility. Uh, where we accelerate electrons, and then these can be broken down into photons. Those photons then interact with a stable element, and then we knock off particles. So for example, if this ball represents, let's just say, zinc, what we can do is irradiate it with our photons, knock out a particle, and now this has essentially become something else. It's a lot like alchemy. So we're transferring zinc into copper here, and then the copper is what we isolate from the zinc, and we can send that off to medical researchers and doctors so that they can create these life-saving drugs and uh, um, medical practices. Uh, we also have uh, ATLAS. Uh, ATLAS is Argonne's tandem linear accelerator. 
Um, and there we can perform research and development on new and exciting radioisotopes that are not available elsewhere. Excellent. So what we're going to do right now is going to take a little segue, but I do want to recap for those who are just joining us what we're talking about today. We're talking about medical isotopes. How are they made? How argon plays a role in their production? And we were just talking to Deputy Program Manager Dave Roche about what isotopes are, and he even brought in uh, alchemy a little bit. And if you're not familiar with alchemy, this is a medieval practice at that time trying to create elements, well, trying to create gold, essentially. Take other elements and create gold. We're not doing that here. We, well, we have better technology for doing that. Let me just say that. But we're not creating gold. We're creating life-saving isotopes that doctors use to diagnose and treat various illnesses, including cancer. Now, to come back, I want to talk to Cal Tarfiti, who is the program manager of the program, so we can get a little bit more of a 50,000-foot view about Argonne's medical isotope program. Welcome to the program, Kautar. Thank you. So, just real quick, my first question for you, actually I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, the first one is, how does Argonne get into the business of producing isotopes? So that's one. But the other one is, what isotopes are you creating here? And, and what's the process by which they're created? So uh, Argonne has a long history uh, in, of course, nuclear energy and nuclear physics. And since the 70s, we have been producing those uh, medical isotopes. And since that time, we build the facility that we are using now. Of course, it's not, it's uh, many new versions of that facility. So we have a long history of know-how, of expertise. And this continued until in the last uh, 10 years or so, NNSA uh, gave us, gave us new funding to do research on moly, moly 99, molybdenum 99. The goal of that research is actually to help industry produce that uh, isotope with low uh, enriched uranium because highly enriched uranium is not something we would like to continue doing. So we have a strong team working on that. We have capabilities in uh, uh, radiochemistry, in accelerator, and this is all our important element to allow us to be in the business of isotopes. So we leverage all the existing expertise that we have at the lab in terms of accelerator physics, uh, radiochemistry, uh, simulation, computing, um, and we wanted to contribute to this important uh, field of saving lives. So we, uh, there are many ways of producing isotopes. Actually, uh, the uh, production of isotopes and also R&D is an important program at the DOE labs. So basically, you can put them in two categories. One is using accelerators, like we have here in LEAF. Of course, LEAF is unique because it's a photon accelerator. It's an electron accelerator which produces photons. But there are other accelerators at Brookhaven National Lab and at Los Alamos, where they use also uh, protons to produce isotopes. And also other technology is using reactors, like we have in Idaho National Lab and also uh, um, Oak Ridge National Lab. So you can see that this production usually, especially for new and exciting isotopes, it really requires heavy um, instrumentation, expensive one, and also highly sophisticated and trained workforce. So my next question is, and we don't have to talk specifically about this, but if you want to get at a general idea of why is copper-67 an idea isotope for cancer therapy? Well, so historically we had isotopes, either they do a diagnostic, which we, you know, when we go do a heart uh, test, cardiac test, we, we have isotope used for that, or used to actually try to treat cancer. What is new about copper 67 is it's both can emit particles that are detected to detect the tumor, but also can emit particles that would uh, kill cancer cells. So it's called uh, um, thera teranos teragnostic for therapeutic and diagnostic, sorry. <laughs> Uh, so you're essentially transforming an element into the other. So Dave mentioned that this was kind of like alchemy, that medieval practice, trying to, you know, using a philosopher's stone to create gold. Um, so what types of facilities are being used to create isotopes? And we talked a little bit about, about LEAF a little bit ago. So Argon has unique capability to add to the lab complex. And in, there is, you know, as I told you, there are accelerators, but these accelerators are proton accelerators. Argon has two unique capabilities. One is 
electron accelerator. So from electron, we produce photons, and those photons will interact with the stable uh, atoms to produce uh, radioisotopes. Uh, and then the other uh, accelerator we have, which is actually the uh, low energy nuclear physics user facility in the nation, ATLAS, which is the linear accelerator, we can produce, do R&D, uh, because this is mainly research for nuclear physics. However, we can use few hours during the year to do R&D and try to produce new isotopes using um, light, you know, like lithium, uh, light ions low energy light ions. So those are nuclear reactions. So in, in, in what they've described, you can kick out electrons, which is simple. But you can also produce new elements by kicking out protons and kicking out you know, two protons, alpha particles. So that's what we have using ATLAS. Okay. So very unique capabilities here at Argonne. And my last question for you, Kautar, is what's novel about this? Why is it important? Well, <laughs> it is important and exciting and new uh, because they are, you know, using isotopes, being able to create molecules that will go and, you know, first of all, the um, biomedical industry is an important component to this, the radiopharmaceutical, because it's nice to produce isotope, which we do. However, hand in hand, as Dave described, you need that claw that grab into that isotopes and don't let them go in the body. And we need also the, the, the vehicle, the target that will go and stick only to the tumor. So this is really novel. Usually we use accelerators to go and you know, radiate with proton therapy uh, tumor. But in that case, you know, there is a lot of damage because we don't know exactly where the proton stops. But this is really a, a mini war. It's a war that we go and target those tumors and then make little bombs to kill the, the tumor without putting much damage to the, the other tissues. And, and the clinical studies really are very promising, especially you know, in stage four metastasis uh, cancer. So very novel, very new. What I wanna do is bring in Dave to, to round out more of our conversation, but that the novelty as Kautar and Dave explained the fact that you can have something that directly targets, we're not talking about, if, if I understand correctly, killing healthy cells along with the, the non-healthy cells, right? So a, a good analogy of this is think about chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is nondescript. It's gonna kill anything inside your body. That's why we have all of these poor side effects, the hair loss, the feeling poor. If we can create something that specifically targets the cancer and largely spares the healthy tissues, that's really, really exciting and a big win for medicine. So one of the things that we talk about at Argonne is science at scale. That's right. It's how we work with teams within Argonne and teams without Argonne to produce scalable science. Uh, so talk about the importance, and this is for uh, Kautar, talk about the importance of working with companies and how this helps us scale up our discoveries. So, uh, you know, uh, the Department of Energy is, is a place where we create a lot of technology and the role of the labs in general is really to uh, strongly make a difference in our economy, create jobs and give the U.S. the uh, competitiveness edge. So we are leading, we know that the, 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 no, the leading in technology is the leading in the world. So part of our job always is to keep in mind once we have a, a level of, of technology development that it's ready to move to industry, we do that all the time. There is nothing different for, for a medical isotope as well. Okay. So this qu next question will be for Dave. Uh, what role does, DOE, does the DOE isotope programs NIDC play in this process? Uh, so the NIDC is the National Isotope Development Center. And this is where uh, interested parties can go to find out what the DOE isotope program has to offer. Uh, there's different isotopes that are available for sale that have been produced at the national laboratories or have been stockpiled um, that can be given or not given but um, sold to customers through the DOE isotope program. Uh, this program also sponsors significant research and uh, program development and um, uh, um, the workforce that is required to perform this work and make sure that these medical isotopes and other isotopes are available to the wider user community. 
And I'm going to come right back to you, Dave, with this question. Um, is it just you working on this program, or are there other people? No, absolutely not. This, I'm not the only one. This is a huge program um, that requires a lot of work from a lot of different disciplines. Um, for example, we have chemists working on this. I'm a chemist. Uh, we have physicists. Kautar is a physicist. Um, we have nuclear engineers. We have chemical engineers. We have industrial engineers. We have beamline scientists. Um, the list just keeps going on and on. Um, it's a multidisciplinary uh, um, area of work, and we need all these key players to make sure that this program is uh, working optimally. <laughs> you need as many people, as, as many irons in the fire as possible to make sure that this works. And Kaltar, I'll come right back to you. One of, one of our last two questions is, um, talk to me a little bit about it. We were talking about R&D earlier. So is this the only facility Argonne has to produce isotopes? And we talked a little bit about Atlas previously, if you want to go right back over those. So, so again, uh, this isotope program is a national program, and uh, uh, the Office of Isotopes coordinates this and work with the community and with the nation to define strategies. All the capabilities we have in National Lab are, are at the service of the program and the nation, so we are very careful not to be redundant in building the same capabilities everywhere. So we have been strategic. For example, Argonne was able to join the program because we have these unique capabilities that is complement to the, the existing program. The uh, uh, LEAF, which is the electron accelerator, and also the low uh, energy uh, um, ion accelerator, mainly light ion that we have in Atlas. Uh, so we use also Atlas to do R&D, uh, to produce other exciting isotopes. And let me remind you that these uh, teragnostic isotopes are really unique because it will allow personalized medicine. So once you make the dose to the patient, you can actually uh, in situ do imaging and see if the treatment is working or not, instead of chemotherapy doing this for six months and then coming back and it's not working. So this is really the medicine of the future to be really able to personalize it. So uh, going back to our capabilities, Atlas is, as I said, again, it's a low energy nuclear physics user facility. Everybody throughout the US and the world come and do experiments in nuclear physics. However, we have uh, some modest amount of beam time that we can use to do exciting R&D. And we use that to produce, to try to produce new and exciting isotope like, like astatine 211, for example. For my last question, I believe Dave or Kaltar, you can take it. And you, you touched on it a little bit, Kaltar, but what is the future? So as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, ISO production at Argonne has been going on a little probably mid-70s, late 70s. Is that correct? Yeah. So what are we looking for to the future? What can we do? So, you know, everything we said today shows you the potential of these radioisotopes. And the community understand the importance and they are eager for us to be able to produce the isotopes needed with the quantity needed and the purity needed. So that's, once we do that, then the clinical trial will continue and will progress and we can hopefully quickly introduce this in the treatment. So we, producing the isotope is one of the things that hold up this because it's hard. It's a lot of R&D. So the future, of course, I can see, unfortunately, I don't want to say bright, bright for R&D, but cancer is not, n not a bright thing to do. But for us, as I, I told you, the office that manages the isotope program, you know, they have strategic planning and they try to enhance the capabilities that are existing. So for example, there are new projects upgrade in Oak Ridge National Lab to produce uh, stable isotopes. So we hope that Argon in the near future will be also able to enhance our uh, capabilities in terms of accelerator and also radiochemistry treatment, and that's what we hope for. And if we are successful in producing interesting isotopes, there is no reason not to expect this bright future. Well, that's all the time we have for today. I want to give a big thank you to Dr. Hal Kautar Hafidi and Dr. Dave Roach for joining us. They are the program manager and deputy program manager of the Argonne Radioisotope Research and Production Program here at Argonne. We talked about a lot of things today, but mainly the takeaway you should have is both of these people 
are doing things that are literally can save lives. We're talking about producing medical isotopes that doctors use to diagnose and treat illnesses, including cancer. They had a fancy word for it. I think it was called theragnostics. I'm, they're the experts. I'm not. But I do want to thank everybody for coming on this program today, and you have a great day.